Hello, again, my name is Craig McDonald. I'm a partner with Accenture here in Los Angeles, and I uh, work with a number of our clients on marketing insight and visualization and data monetization for them. So did you want me to start answering all those questions or just no, do my intro? All. Yes. all right. <laughs> 60 seconds sounded a little tight for that. Hi, my name is uh, Brian Duke. I run sales for uh, the ValueClick uh, Technology and Marketing and Analytics Division. Uh, I'm based uh, here in uh, LA. Yeah, Flavia Lam from Riot Games. I drive uh, web analytics efforts across all our uh, digital platforms. Uh, in Riot Games, it's kind of like a full line discipline, uh, cross functional. So, web analytics team actually uh, does the technical tra tracking solution design. We monitor the implementation. We decide what data we want to collect, and we analyze the data we purposefully collected and trying to deliver like uh, informative insights and uh, actionable recommendations to help the company to make a data informed decision. That's a term we're using in Riot, which is data informed decision. I'm very happy to uh, come here to share with you one or two things that I uh, learned from uh, working for Riot Games and, and my past company. Uh, hopefully that's also uh, relevant and applicable for you. And I'm uh, Dorian Kiesman from LegalZoom.com. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, uh, our goal is to be the first place for small businesses and families to turn to for everyday legal needs, so business formations and estate planning type documents. I'm the VP of acquisition, so I oversee uh, digital uh, and uh, off offline as well, so TV and radio. So we deal with a lot of data. Why don't you start? Tell us what's working right now with your data, making data-driven decisions. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, well, we have a lot of challenges, right? We have a lot of channel conflicts, so we're, we have very mature channels in uh, the online space. Uh, but for this last year, we uh, got very aggressive in display, something that uh, for the 12 years the company has been around, we have uh, always had a challenge with, right? And that just came down to attribution. Uh, while we have uh, very mature metrics when it comes to TV, radio, and SEM, uh, display is something that we typically had a problem with. And so this sounds like a plug, but we work with Convertro, which is one of the sponsors. Uh, and uh, we've been able to use that system to understand what the value is of a view through in conjunction uh, to all the other channels that we have. So uh, we have the, the unique uh, problem where uh, someone who's looking at, say, to start a business is not an impulse decision, right? It, it is it's someone who crosses a, a point of consideration. And there is a lot of thought that goes into that. So we'll see people who interact with LegalZoom and then convert a month to two months or three months after the fact. And so trying to understand the value of all the marketing channels where they come in through paid search, organic, see a video or see a uh, display becomes very challenging to understand the value of all that. So we've been uh, attacking that for this year, uh, assigning a, a decent budget uh, quarter after quarter and have been learning quite a bit. And, uh, coming up with our own, our own uh, internal view using different uh, reporting tools, Convertio being one of them, to understand how that program is working and then learning to scale it up. So uh, attribution and channel conflict is something we're constantly uh, striving to solve. Cool. Sorry, go ahead next. I was distracted by the yelling going on. Hey, Paul, can you ask them to quiet down just a little bit outside? No? OK. Uh, <laughs> I'm good friends with Paul. He tells me what to do. Yeah, uh, Riot Games, we actually say that we want to make data informed decision. I guess the term like data driven decision is just a per perceived a little differently in each organization. But it doesn't matter, we call it data informed or data driven. I guess uh, all the organizations, this is a trend that we are trying to utilize data to make a good decision. Like a couple years ago, there's a lot of frustration. I guess uh, everybody have heard of uh, HIPPO decision making. How many people have heard of a HIPPO, right? highest pay the uh, people's opinion in the past was like a um, kind of a dominating. We, we see a lot of on bro uh, not blog or forums, but these days you heard more about like, how we set up our analytics team, how we, uh, what kind of analytics tool we should, uh, we should choose, and uh, how, what kind of analytics approach we should take. So uh, I'm someone coming from an uh, analytics team, so my perspective, what's working or what's not may, may be a little different. So I found what's working, Hippo obviously is no longer working that well, because Hippo uh, is like, a, um, uh, the leaders uh, have a great business instinct, but they also need the data to assist them. Um, not only use instinct, but also use what's proven or disapproved to help the future decision making. 
Uh, well, I found if uh, any of the organization is doing the following three or one of the three, and this company is absolutely on a good track to make uh, to be successful on making data-driven decision. Why is that? Uh, enable your analyst or your analytics team to really help you to ask the right business question. So you are not uh, asking them about the metrics. You are asking them to give you an intellectual uh, analytics, analytics approach. Like you are uh, not telling them, I just wanted a bounce rate, but instead you tell them the, the story behind the why you want the bounce rate. So they may come up with something uh, um, in addition to the bounce rate, there's a better metric measure what you, you, you really, the insights that really, you really want to have. The second thing is that you really want to tell your uh, analytics team and your analysts, like uh, task them and challenge them that I want you to find out uh, the needs of our uh, newest, uh, I mean, our newest audience behavior pattern, their newest needs. I want you to monitor the newest emerging digital channel, like a mobile. Like uh, you task them with uh, uh, um, this uh, big challenge so they can be more focused and uh, setting a new goal on how to help you, which is a business user, to obtain what you, want to, what you want to get. And the third thing is the equation of cost and the return equation. You want to empower your analytics team to come up with this equation and not trying to like, uh, um, uh, just uh, have metric and reports to come up by yourself. You can ask them, please come up with this uh, cost and a return equation. We have so many uh, digital channels that we want to invest. We have so many uh, segments that we can target. But what other, uh, at what time, at which uh, segment, and uh, at what uh, given events, like uh, we can invest a certain an area that leads the highest return which uh, highest return may not be monetary. Monetary, it could be like uh, your brand value, could be your uh, audience engagement. If like uh, I find if you are doing one of these three, then um, um, you are really uh, making data-driven decision. Great. Hey, quick question for the people in the room that don't know what Hippo is, which is me. Uh, <laughs> what is Hippo? Hippo means uh, uh, highest paid people's opinion. Basically, that's a, a, a opposite of the data-driven or data-informed approach. Oh, so hit, so let me see if I understand <laughs> this. If data-driven decisions mean the analysts go, hey, I found data that says we should not be doing this on the front page, we should be doing this, but Hippo is the CEO goes, I see our company moving this direction. Yeah, is that the, right? The the highest paid guy making the decision. Okay, cool. All right, that was very helpful. Thanks. Brian, next. Um, so... At ValueClick, we work with a lot of different clients across a number of different verticals, brands directly, agency holding companies, independent agencies. Um, and I think that the, the common thing that we see across the industry is that as we talk to CMOs, is that you know they struggle with the fact that as they generate more data, as they invest in more channels, the more uh, users they acquire, the more devices they get connected, they become they, they, further and further displaced from the actual consumer themselves. And I think that, you know, one, I still see a lot of brands, big brands, Fortune 100 brands that are still managing data within specific silos. I've got search teams, affiliate teams, email display teams. I've got email teams. I've got CRM teams. And none of them are talking to each other. They're not sharing data. They don't have any way to collaborate and unify data across all of those channels. Um, and I think that, you know, that's the, 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 the genesis of the problem, right, is that we can't understand and identify accurately users as they step across various channels in which we invest and we don't have the ability that to, to in, a, in a really a really good way to link um, you know cookie based data to uh, to a mobile ID and I think that that's really you know kind of the next big hurdle that we have to to clear but I would say first to answer the question is managing data, data in silos and then applying the incorrect metrics and, and, and measurement strategies to the data to uncover what we really need to do um, you know and so I would say that those are probably the two top things that, that I see that most people are struggling with Craig walk us through what's working uh, so the question was what's working I'll, I'll step back for one second you know I, at Accenture, I'm lucky enough to be able to see all sorts of, uh, we get pitched all sorts of opportunities and new solutions that are coming to the market. And the first thing I would say is that we are living in a time of unparalleled innovation in this marketplace right now. I mean, and in digital marketing in particular. If you look over the last 10 years, I mean, what's working? The prediction that all the money was going to start moving off of online and online, that's happening, right? The fact that there are more choices available for marketers now than ever before, which 
unfortunately is a daunting challenge, but it is also a fantastic opportunity that is working. You're working in a ecosystem that is every day bringing you new opportunities to connect to clients, new ways to connect to clients, new form factors by which to connect to clients. I'd say the third thing that's working too, I, I used to run a digital agency here in San Diego uh, in Southern California for six years or something like that. And boy, finding talent was impossible. And just the pool of people that can actually do analytics, that know how to actually do data management, that know data science. Whereas you couldn't find these people before and you just took anybody who could walk down the street and chew gum and you know, knew the word Excel. You grab them and hold on to them forever and you just saw their salaries go up until they got good and then they just fly off to one of the holding companies. You know, that ecosystem's starting to get deeper and so getting talent to do this type of work is getting better. It doesn't mean there's not significant challenges, but those are the things I'm seeing that are working out there right now. And you know, again, um, at Accenture, we're seeing the clients, I'd say the last thing is that we mostly work with Fortune 1000 types. One of my clients is one of the big telcos here in the United States. The other thing that's starting to work is it's starting to get through to marketing, largely because of a draconian need by all big companies to control cost and to be more efficient with what is in most cases the largest discretionary budget in a company, the media budget or the marketing budget. <coughs> because they're under such draconian pressure to make that, squeeze every last penny out of that, they're getting it. They're realizing data has to be an asset. My ability to differentiate is not going to come from being big and having a big brand. It's going to be from being good with data and knowing how to organize that. Now, they have no, by no means gotten into job on this issue. But at least they know it's something they've got to start working on. We're seeing the investment come into this, yeah, you know, gangbusters. It's the fastest growing area of Accenture right now. Yeah, I would say on that too, uh, you know, McKinsey put out a study probably a couple years ago talking about the shortage and people that have a quantitative background and that, you know, I think you're starting to see that, that CIOs, the legacy CIO position is really shifting to more of, a, of an analytics uh, officer, someone that does have the quantitative background because after all it is about managing information and so, you know, understanding that, that you have to have a specific skill set in order to manage data to apply the correct analytics to the data, that's, uh, I think that some certain companies that I've seen are starting to move that way and it's, it's, it's paying a lot of dividends to them. Hey Dorian, walk us through what isn't working right now. Uh, well, I think the biggest problem, and a lot of us have talked about before, there's just a lot of data we have, right? So uh, what's interesting about, you know, the comment of the CIO becoming more of the analytics person, uh, what's, what's, aiding, well, what's adding to that problem is the CMO is becoming the technology person in the company, right? So uh, there's tons and tons of third-party tools that everyone's using for their marketing activities, right? For measurement, uh, for actually pushing your media out, tracking. Uh, and so there is... In, in addition to the, the channel conflict that naturally resides in, in any company that has big budgets and it's doing TV and radio and doing display and, and search, uh, is that you have different KPIs, different reporting for all these different systems, and everyone reports in silos. And then you have the classic problem where you're, say, very mature and you have diminishing returns. The CEO is like, okay, we have an extra $2 million to spend. Like, where do you spend it? And how do you know uh, you're getting that return on investment, right? And so uh, I think a problem, and it's, 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 you know, going back to you can't find the right talent is you have different systems, different tracking, different reporting. None of it is universal. None of it plugs and plays very nicely. Uh, and uh, I think everyone uh, is, is feeling that type of pain. Uh, internally, uh, since we've had a challenge finding people with analytical backgrounds, we, we've nicknamed them purple squirrels because you just can't find them. You know, they just, it's, it's so difficult. We'll spend a year trying to find a good analyst. And so it's, it, that is it's not working for us at all. The talent is not there. Yeah, um, well, what's not working? I, um, Going back to the like a data driven or data informed direction, and also from a, a, like I'm coming from an analytics team, I found that when organizations are collecting a lot of data, but when these data are not targeted to your business question, that's not working. It's like a, you can uh, there's two kinds of uh, uh, tracking tools on the market. One is very customized, uh, tailored, but you need to uh, be able to know. Uh, what to do to be able to tailor and to customize the tool. Then everything come out, uh, out of this tool is like you programmed this robot to collect specific things that you want to collect. Then in those cases, your data is very, very uh, focused 
on, on your problem and answers exactly that you are what you are asking. Another type of a tool is like uh, collecting everything. Like uh, in, in in addition to traffic, they collect a lot of uh, out of box uh, metrics, which uh, isn't really uh, tailored to what you need. And you could find that these tools are really really fancy, have a lot of data, but you just don't know where to put them into use. I found that that's not working. That's why like earlier I mentioned these three things, like uh, really be able to communicate it to your analytics team. What is your business question? What is the story that you want to tell with data? Data. And what is the insight that you, you want to obtain? So that way, uh, uh, of course, that um, uh, maybe some of the um, in some of the company, the analytics team is still maturing, but still encourage them to go that route. You the earlier you can be ben benefited from uh, like uh, um, helping them to grow, and they help you to grow, and really have a targeted data centered on your business question, and everything in, in is about your core goal. What is your business goal? And break down that in detail. And uh, looking at the timing, looking at the segment, really, really be able to go into uh, details of each uh, each channel and uh, each segment and be able to tell if I do this, I'm going to be successful on that. Because making data-driven decision eventually it comes back to uh, uh, with data suggestion, what do we do the next? What do we do next? And uh, should we keep doing what we're doing? So that's, uh, yeah, I found, um, yeah. That's uh, what I, I think. That's a good quote. With the data's suggestion, what should we do? I think that's kind of a key takeaway. Forgetting what everybody else in the room says. That's really cool. Um, very, very helpful. Brian, what's not working in the industry right now? Or at least what you're seeing? Right. Um, I, I would say that legacy uh, metrics for or how we actually buy media based on a CPA or a CPC basis, I'd say it's not working. And I think any statistician that, that has uh, a, a solid background will, will absolutely agree with me. Um, you know, how are we structuring contracts and how are we motivating our media partners? Um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of marketers that say, well, I only pay for performance. And I'm like, oh, really? Well, tell me about that performance that you're actually paying for. Well, we only pay on a, on a CPA p basis. And, you know, we only pay for people that actually uh, perform a specific type of action. And you start uncovering what that actually is. And you really find out that, you know, what am I really motivating my media partners to do? I'm motivating them to go and find people that have ex exhibited a lot of intent in their hand raisers because they've come to my site, they've, they've filled out a shopping cart, and then they abandon at some point. And so it becomes a race to pepper that person with as many ads as possible right before they convert. So I can hope to be the last ad seen and the last ad clicked right before that happens. And that in absolutely no way is indicative of of, of incremental value being created. You're just fulfilling a demand and that has some value, but what is that value really? And, you know, I think that, you know, you could talk about CPC the same way. And I, I, I see that, you know, a, a lot of people that buy on that particular type of model, you know, I ask them flat out, I say, you know, well, tell me what is the decaying rate of conversion on those clicks? And I just get blank stares and they're, they can't even answer the question. And I say to them, so assuming there is a decaying rate of conversion on the click, you're, you're, one of two things is happening. Either A, your e-com team, and I love it when I ask this question if the e-com team is actually in the room, is doing a poor job of converting users at that point, or your media partner is just shoving a bunch of garbage through the door. So I think it's, it's ultimately, you know, we have a singular economically rational goal as, as advertisers. It's just to generate incremental sales from ad spend. I think we can probably all agree on that. And you know, that's to say that sales, it wouldn't have happened you know, in the absence of the marketing presence. And so that's a lesson in, in, in causal inference. And that's a lesson in, 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 the, in a statistical conversation that's not being had. And so again, these legacy metrics on how people are, uh, are buying media are, are not working because your media partners are gonna optimize to the letter of the law. They're only doing what you're asking them to do. And so it's not their fault and it's not necessarily the advertisers or the agency's fault because they've never had a really a way uh, to, 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 to use data in such a way to uncover that. I'm kind of excited. I'm overwhelmed by what you just said, but I'm really excited. <laughs> True story, I'm just like a regular dude but loves looking at Excel, but you just kind of blew me away. So Craig, talk to us about what's not working. Give us some, some tactical tips. What's not working right now? Okay, can I tell a, ask a question first? Yes. Because I've prepared my answer. I love it. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
So before I came to Accenture, I was running marketing for Bing, Microsoft search engine. Before that, I worked at Google. And I remember going through, everybody here saw the internship. I remember going through nuclear training before I got my little beanie with a little thing on top of it. And um, when I was going through training, uh, Susan Wasicki, who runs monetization for Google, was giving a presentation to all the Nooglers that day. It was her turn. And um, N- Nooglers? Nooglers. New- that's a Nooglers. new Googler? Yeah. That's cool. You have to see the movie. I um, haven't seen the movie. Who's seen the movie? Raise your hand. <laughs> Intern. Less than 10% of the people in the room have seen it. It's That's not cool. That good a movie, Noogler. Noogler. There you go. It's not that good a movie. You can, you can determine tweet that, that on your own time. Um, so I asked the question to Susan. I said, who's our biggest competitor? What do you think she said? What do you think? Who do you, and for those of you who are here from Google before, you can't answer this question. Um, but uh, who do you, what do you, this is two years ago or three years ago. But who do you think Google at that time thought was their biggest competitor? I think they may still do, do so today. That's somebody said fa- somebody said Facebook in the back. Now the big question: Why? Scale. No, Google's said, much bigger than Facebook. May, may win more hits, and they make a hell of a lot more money. Uh, who who doesn't use who doesn't use Google globally? They have ninety percent, ninety five percent market share globally. Is it the amount of time spent on websites? No, just in the interest of time. Close, but no. The reason wasn't Larry Page used to use this in our Friday morning meeting. Can you guys hear him? None of the microphones are working? Uh, I can talk in closer. What are you saying, Paul? So I could actually use the microphone, and that might help. Um, hold it close to my mouth. Um, but you know, the, the reason that Facebook was considered the competitor is Larry would say, if somebody goes to Google and they type in the word, I'm looking for a restaurant, or I'm looking for a restaurant, right? Um, I'm going to serve up a series of ads. Roos Chris Steakhouse, the pizza place, the Indian place, yada, yada. Facebook, though, knows if you're a vegetarian because they see the context of everything you're doing, right? And so they would know, don't serve up the Roos Chris Steakhouse ad, serve up the vegetarian Indian place down the street, because they know location and all the rest of that stuff. And I'm only using that story to say, you know, what, what's broken is that though I do see marketing organizations finally investing in data, finally investing in analytics, finally doing all this stuff, I see a lot of them missing the point. They don't understand that sustainable competitive advantage doesn't come from a trick doesn't come from a tactic I learned from that guy over there that can be applied to this very, very narrow situation. It's about creating a systematic way to know more about consumer intent than my competition. I was over in Paris last week and I was giving a presentation to the CMO of one of the major French banks. And I was making this exact point because he was asking us, in the world where the bank is now in my pocket, how, and, you know, but we still have all of our money trapped up in a, ban- in a branch system and in ATMs and all that stuff, how are we going to win this battle against PayPal? and against Amazon, against all these other places. And I said, you're not unless you systematically change the way you think about your clients. And you have to have an information advantage over your clients. And if you don't do that, the whole thing will never work. It'll never work. You can never make the analytics smart enough if your, cl- if your competitor has just better damn data about what the consumer intent is. And that's the one thing I think that's broken. I don't think most marketers think about it that way. They don't think about it the way Google thinks about it. Google thinks about it that fundamentally you need an information advantage. And then the rest of it can happen, right? I can get good analysts, I can get in place scalable systems, I can put in place an ecosystem that will ultimately allow me to treat that customer better. And if I can treat that customer better, I can upsell them better, I can keep them from churning, I can do all the things that marketing people do uh, you know, a- as routine. But they need that information advantage. I think that's the number one kind of like fundamental piece of insight that's still missing from most marketing people, particularly at the CMO level. And if that can get through, then you know, there's going to be a race for how to get data. And the reality is you know, something that's not broken. There's more data about clients out there than there's ever been before. And the cost of getting access to that data has never been cheaper. But there's so much of it, companies are stuck. And they just, everybody's been talking about siloed data, attribution. Those are all ramifications of this fundamental piece. Have an information advantage over your competition. That's pretty cool. All right, let's talk about my favorite part. We're moving on to tools, what tools we're using, and I think that is the most appropriate question for this Making Data-Driven Decisions panel. So let's start with Dorian, LegalZoom. Talk to us about some of the tools. Now give us tactics, no 40,000 foot, or we're looking for tools, and and I like all of you guys, but this is my job in the world, is to keep it tactical, because I want everybody here on Monday to go, hey, I learned about this new tool, and they start using it. So give us a tool that, that is available to us that you're using, and it doesn't have to be the biggest, it could be like, hey, here's a new one that we're using, or two tools. Uh, well, I've been with the company for almost three years, so a lot of our tool development, our onboarding new tools happened uh, quite a while ago, so you, you probably heard a lot of these names, but one of the biggest challenges we had 
in just collecting data was just deploying pixels across the site. You know, you wouldn't think that is too difficult, but you have a 12-year-old website with thousand, thousand pages, very, uh, very complex checkout process, and deploying a tag required uh, co-founder approval and review in months. Right, so that doesn't really work for marketing. So one of the first things we did is onboard Telium as a tag management system. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, but there's quite a few people in the space. You really want to think tag management is a very critical system or tool that it is. And a lot of these guys are now evolving into, I would say, like a data warehouse type structure. Right, since tag management, they deploy your tags across your site. They sit in between your site, your users, and like Google Analytics, your testing platform. Uh, I mean, various other tools are used. Since they sit in between every other system, they collect that data as well, and you could actually uh, reach out to them and do big queries and, and pull selected information out. So it's something to take a look at. Uh, landing page optimization was a big issue. Optimizely uh, was a little company we started working with three years ago. It, I think they're like one of the number one tools right now in landing page testing. Uh, very simple to deploy. Uh, you know, uh, originally a landing page test would take six weeks to deploy, and we we're able to you know, turn that down to a day. Right. So who's used Optimizely? Raise your hand. No, write yeah. that down. It's a pretty cool tool. Yeah, it's it's absolutely great. San Francisco company, great guys. Uh, they made their claim because they worked on the Obama campaign uh, way back in the day, and then from there started their company. Uh, so Optimize has been great. Uh, we we use uh, a lot of different vendors in terms of uh, retargeting. So. There's, there's tons of retargeting shops out there. You could, you could partner up with a retargeting shop. That's all they do. Uh, we went the route of working with the DSP. So we work with DataZoo, uh, having uh, a really good run with them. Uh, and of course, for attribution tracking, we use Convertro. And that uh, has been an, an interesting relationship for us because we, we were pitched it years ago, didn't really believe it. Then we revisited it like a year later uh, and uh, implemented it. And now we're at the point where we have all our digital uh, assets and channels tagged, uh, but now we're looking at bringing offline data in so we actually see the relationship between our radio and TV spend with uh, website activity. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm a big fan of that. What was Very the name of the first one? Uh, Telium. Telium, the uh, tag management. There, there's like a couple like Bright Tag. Um, there's Insightin and then Telium. Uh, and even Google has their own tag management system now, uh, which is free because it's Google, right? Uh, and so uh, there's uh, quite a bit of value in, in having that type of marketing infrastructure. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Flavia, what tools are you using? One or two? Yeah, um, going back to the tools, I want you to go back to the, like, uh, the, your business goal. Why you want to have tools? Because you want to have, want to have analytics. Then you ask yourself, why you want to have analytics? Then uh, if you do check this on the Wikipedia, you find like uh, web analytics means that you wanted to, your goal was to optimize your uh, online assets. Then, but, but before you can optimize, you need to understand. But before you can understand, you need to observe the, the right things. And um, I found, because our, well, our tool, we have a lot of tools. I, I, I don't want to mention what didn't work. I, I rather mention like a, what's recommended. I think it's all tailored to your uh, business scale, tailored to your budget, tailored to what kind of insights you want to obtain. If you uh, are at the beginning stage, uh, uh, you are trying to see which of your uh, external campaign is running well, then you probably need uh, some tool that's m can more tailored to that particular uh, needs. Like uh, you, you, you want to be able to label this campaign, track the conversion, then uh, Adobe site colors may be more suitable for you. But if you are at the level that you, you want, you, you are still stay at like, I just want to understand uh, the scale of my, 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 my uh, visitors. I'm not yet running any campaign and I don't have the budget for an uh, 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 expensive tool, then Google Analytics as a free tool may be good for you and uh, you can start to, first of all, observe the visit, uh, like the traffic pattern. Anytime you release a new content, you can kind of observe the lifespan of that content and observe the behavior change, uh, or, I mean, according to that campaign. Maybe your, your tracking hasn't been released to go into your conversion like, or your revenue or any other success events that you want to lead to. But you can observe that uh, like, uh, 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 with your web traffic uh, uh, pattern change. Depends on like uh, what kind of scale you're at. I'm a fan of able to customize a tool, use the tool to do exactly what I'm doing. So I, I'm not a, um, 
I'm not linear towards uh, having a tool, uh, I'll have a lot of uh, out of the box feature. I like to be able to control the tool, like control the robot. So the tool does exactly what I want, want this tool to do and uh, collects the data exactly tailored to what uh, questions that I want to answer. Um, Adobe uh, Sidecast is a powerful tool. Very, uh, could be expensive for you, dep depends on, on your uh, budget and your uh, development. Google uh, uh, site uh, uh, Google Analytics is free, and uh, an important tool would be like because uh, when we talk about optimization, then we go back to the testing tool. And again, Adobe offers a test and target, which is a, a pricey tool, and uh, you can find a, a free tool like a Google Optimizer. It's, these are uh, all tools like uh, you can choose to use. So I, I will be glad to discuss with you guys more if you have questions after this. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Brian. What tools are you using? Um, well, the, the idea being data driven, uh, I think it originates with having clean data, meaning that data is, it's, it's, it's normalized, it's classified and categorized in such a way that we can actually understand it and so that it's the same coming out of the system as it is going into the system. I think that's a big problem that a lot of the DMPs struggle with today. So we use a lot of things. We use tag management systems uh, to manage things on the site. You know, 99% of the data occurs off of the site. So we use ad servers to track uh, multi-channel event level data at, at the cookie level. Um, we use uh, Greenplum for our data warehouse, which is essentially distributed Hadoop, if you are familiar with that type of architecture. Um, once the data is, is cleansed and in such a way we can use it, we use tools like uh, Hive to query the data. Uh, we use R statistical modeling packages uh, to build uh, the experiments. Uh, then we use Tableau uh, for visualization. And that's, you know, that's pretty commonplace kind of stuff. I mean, there's nothing exciting about that. It's uh, really more about the people that are, are, are using the tools, which is the, 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 the much more critical part of this than, than anything else. Very cool. Craig, what tools are you using? Yeah, I, honestly, I, I struggled with this question because I, I kind of the same position you do, which is that I can give you a whole, Accenture works with every tool. I can give you a long, long laundry list of every single tool out there, web analytics systems, DSPs, DMPs, ad servers, yada, yada. And that's not what the differentiation is. Those things are all, you know, if they're on the market, except we don't really see like the flashy stuff because we only install stuff that's really super battle hardened because we have to deal with these giant companies that need stuff that's, you know, 18, ways, you know, uh, tested out in quality. We, we get killed if it doesn't work. We get fired. That's bad. Um, where I've seen the, so I'm going to talk about tools slightly differently than just process tools and say, I'm going to give you two things that I've seen in the last six months of my career at Accenture, which I was like going, that's pretty freaking cool, right? And they're solving very particular problems. You may or may not have these problems. The first one is um, we work with huge spirits company. They make uh, liquor, right? And they have a problem that a lot of companies have. All the um, the, you know, the uh, movie studios here in, in Los Angeles have them, card companies have them, which is a three-tier distribution model. I'm sitting here as, as the manufacturer. I sell my stuff to a bunch of distributors who then sell it out to a bunch of retailers and to get out there. And the way I, I have no relationship with the end customer whatsoever, no relationship whatsoever. That's way down the line for me. My biggest problem, though, is that I'm throwing trade promotion money. I mean billions of dollars out into the market to get these people to go, run my promotions, set up the stuff at the bars that show the, you know, the dancing girls and show up the stuff on my, on, you know, on the digital side that's going to run the creative that I want them to run about my beer or my spirit exactly the way I want to. And there's no way to verify that it's actually happening. And so that's the big problem out there right now is just how do you figure out whether or not all this money I'm throwing at my distribution partners is actually working. The cool thing we've seen is there's been two apps that have come out. One's called Kegman, if you can believe that. I'll explain what it does in a second, which I think is the greatest name. Uh, and the other one, I'll have to find it and send it to you. I just, I just saw it last week. But they're apps you can run on your phone that it, they basically crowdsource feedback from people who go to bars, hopefully before they get way too drunk, and you have them fill out a survey and say, what are you seeing? Give me a timestamp, tell me where you are, and are you seeing the thing that I, that's supposed to be there from my distributor? And if you do, I'm gonna send a dollar or five dollars to your PayPal account, and you can redeem that as you would anything on PayPal, right? And so they're trying to create a little market to crowdsource feedback about the, basically create a feedback loop about the physical distribution of all this content they're creating, and they spend literally, this is how they market as trade promotions, billions of dollars on this stuff. And you can imagine, the studios have the same thing. I, built, I spent all this money on, a, on building a film, and I gotta make sure the picture of Tom Cruise or whatever is set up at the right place at the theater. There's no way to do that except having 
the population come back and, and, and give you feedback on that. The mm -hmm. second one I'll talk about is, sorry, what's that? No, it's genius. It, it's pretty cool. That well, was called Keg Man. I think it's called Keg Man, and there's another one which I'll, I'll send you the thing you can Thank you. Send and we'll distribute these apps yeah. to all of you. As soon as you can put your Amex on file with me, <laughs> just keep going. By the way, I'll, I'll tell one funny story about that. There's 90% joke, 10% truth to that. Keep going. The spirits company we're working with, they had an SEO error. You know, if you've ever worked with liquor companies, when you go there, they have to do age verification before you go to the website, so they say, are you over under 18 in the United States? And they had this great bug in their system. I used to, like I so said, we did the SEO for them for a while at my previous company. And um, if you selected you were over 18, you went to the site that had vodka and their vodka drink. If you selected that you were under 18, they sent you to the site that had all the beer. I'm not entirely sure what judgment that makes. So you, you can figure that out. I, I still haven't gotten to the bottom of that one. The other one is that we've been working on a project at Accenture with the big wireless carriers out in the United States uh, and overseas in France and New Zealand and Canada. And they're all coming out with a new data source. In, in the United States, Verizon offers a product called Precision Market Insights. It's really super cool and it integrates with like Blue Kai from a DMP perspective. Uh, so the, the reality is, is they know who you are and where you are, right? And besides the NSA stuff that came up earlier in the year, they do that, right? And Because um, they can basically see any time you activate your phone, it's hitting a bunch of cell towers. You can triangulate back within about 50 meters your location, and that can be used for all sorts of very interesting marketing purposes. What Verizon doesn't want to do, though, is they don't want to have to build out all the infrastructure to use that from an ad perspective. So they're basically sending aggregated, not personally identified, you know, hope you're there, Andy, you're there. You know, they're not getting down to that level, but they're aggregating us into demographic segments, providing that information to the DMPs. I'm pointing to you as if you were a DMP. <laughs> so that you have new targeting dimensions when you're trying to do targeted mobile and or display ads based off a of geolocation, which is super sensitive, super accurate, that never really existed before. Plus, combined with all the information about your mobile usage, what apps you have, they can put you in categories that a marketer never had access to before. What apps do you have on your phone probably says something about you. Where you visit frequently probably says something about you. And that's creating a series of data assets that have never been available to marketers before. They're very powerful for creating better CTRs and conversion rates. Very cool. Helpful. Okay, so let's move on. This is the last question. Then we're going to get some Q&A. We're doing okay on time. Give us a case study. Just something real quick. Who is doing this correctly? And I know you guys are all doing this in your own. Um, Give us an example in the industry, a tactical example, nothing too high level. Hey, there's a, there's a story of a company that s thought that their customers wanted this. They looked at the data and they're like, holy crap, uh, let's, make a, let's do a test somewhere else. And that turned out to unlock a whole lot of things. You guys have any of that? Flavia, let's start with you. Yeah, I think uh, like uh, uh, quickly, uh, there's a uh, company um, pump up in my mind, which is uh, North Face. Uh, I guess lots of us uh, have their uh, like uh, closing. So a couple of years ago, they founded like their search term have a like a iPhone glove. So they found that like a lot of people are searching iPhone glove. So which means like uh, you can because with your phone you cannot with with your glove you cannot touch your iPhone. So then this should be exposing your fingertips so that you can touch iPhone. Then they uh, uh, identified this uh, uh, consumer needs. Everything is about like uh, meeting your consumer needs. So they produced this uh, iPhone glove and made a lot of, uh, um, I mean, revenue, I would say. <laughs> like uh, they're basically, they're, uh, that's uh, like uh, uh, the data in this case, uh, uh, implementation and the UT use the data really brought a, a very high ROI. This is one, uh, one of the example. Another example would be like uh, the uh, leading European um, toy maker, which is Top Toy. Like they noticed like um, in the past, uh, in a, over a one year, their uh, mobile traffic ac actually grew to 121%. And over a quarter, grew like a, a quarter, or uh, uh, like a, uh, 25%. So they decided that it, it is necessary to invest, like uh, optimize the site and the online assets to be more mobile friendly. And that turns out to be having a great return. And uh, over two year period, like uh, their revenue increased uh, 250%. So I think those are That's the great. examples of using data. Cool. I like that North Face idea, the iPhone glove. Very cool. You guys have any other ideas? 
Dorian? I, I came on, uh, came across one a few months ago, and I can't actually remember the name of the app, but it was a, it was a food tracking app, right? You lose it or something like that. Uh, they started, you know, basically farming their data and providing it over to the big brands, and they realized, I think it was for, like, Triscuit or Nabisco or Wheat Thin, something like that, where most of uh, the people that they were tracking were putting cream cheese on versus actual slice of cheese. So they actually changed the packaging that they, uh, they, they, they display in the stores because the whole time their packaging had a slice of cheese on it, and they realized nobody was really eating it that way. And so I thought that was actually a really That's interesting cool. use of data use from an app that people enjoy using to track their weight. That's very cool. Craig, are you is anybody here familiar with the Target example of the pregnant teenager? Anybody heard that one? I mean, that's classic. Right? This is a good one. You, you got to tell this. This is a good one. Has anybody, raise your hand if you've heard of it. You've it's heard classic. of it? About not uh, seven of us. Myth, this is a good good example. Yeah, so, uh, you know, if you're a retailer like Target and you have the little affinity cards, they basically track every single purchase that you make. They can associate with you and your name and as a household, et cetera. And um, they, uh, if I remember the story correctly, um, they started getting th this, the, 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 this couple had a child who was like 15, 16 years old daughter, um, and the Target started sending them solicitations for all these pregnancy-related products, um, you know, uh, feminine hygiene products, et cetera, because they were monitoring the affinity cards and what people were purchasing, and the daughter was using the affinity card. And the, and the uh, you know, the, the thing was, is he kept writing to Target saying, why are you sending me this stuff? Your algorithm's way off. You can't possibly mean our family, because my daughter's certainly not pregnant. Turns out she was. And Target knew more than the parents did, because oh. they could see what people were buying. And uh, you know, the, 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 the issue with that type of stuff, you know, we had the same rule at Google, which was, you know, don't be creepy. And I think they thought Target was on the creepy side of the line, but they were actually on the right side of the line, if you, if you go that way. So. I think uh, Amazon, I sat down with some gentlemen that were in the data business, and they said Amazon had to detune the recommendation engine because it was getting creepy how the suggestions that it had. And we could probably Google the Amazon recommendation engine. I think there's a whole case study on that as well. Uh, anything else, Brian? Um, as far as case studies, uh, you know, there's, I, there's, a, there's a tax uh, preparation software company that, uh, that I work with, and I think that, you know, they've done a, a really good job as far as not making assumptions about who their audience uh, is. Uh, they had, you know, been buying media the same way for years and years and years and years, um, just making, guys essentially mapping their, their CRM file to, to, to their media vendors and saying, these are the types of people that are my customers. I want you to go out and segment that audience and buy it for me. Well, they, they, they failed to realize that there are entire populations of people out on the web that are on the fringe of their customer file that if you would, were to put ads in front of, that you could generate you know, incremental value, um, people that you had never otherwise considered before. And so uh, we did a, a study for them and you know, we found that you know, over the period of, of this past tax season, they spent around 50 million uh, in digital and they only made about 15 million bucks. Um, so it was, a, it was a waste of 35. Conversely, um, you're able to isolate, or we were able to help them isolate, um, you know, roughly 20 million uh, in revenue for people that were never shown ads over the entire tax season. And so, it's uh, it, it's 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 now a conversation with how they they now manage their media. So, um, them, I think uh, uh, Avis uh, is doing the, is doing the same thing. Uh, Macy's, we don't work with them, but I know those guys pretty well, and uh, they're doing a lot of the similar things to uncover these new sources of revenue. So again, it's you get yourself into trouble when you start making assumptions about things, and so it's better to go out and prove it. Cool. Let's do. Oh, we've got time for two questions, then a quick break. Who's got some questions? Yes. So the question for the video sure. people watching the video, the question was the cost per click and CPA sure. are not no longer a good way to buy media or to look at that. Is that right? Did I get that question right? Uh, yes. And then what is a good yes. way? Yes. So typically we've 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 said to our clients, it's either you go fully on board with an analytic solution that can prove out uh, the incremental value being created across the entire media plan, not just within display, uh, or and you do that. We typically make the suggestion that you go to a flat CPM, uh, and in a lot of those cases, we tell the media vendors, hey, you know, you can go run the campaign any way you want to. Uh, we don't really care. Um, because you're going to be measured on the incremental value that you're bringing to the table. And if you can get with the program and optimize accordingly, you'll get more money on the media plan. 
Um, so typically that, that looks like a restructuring to uh, flat CPM and just running it how you want to. But again, um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's highlighting the disconnect in how we buy media versus um, you know, what we're incented to, to, to bring in the door because you, know, you don't make money directly on an action or a click. And I used this example with a client recently uh, who's in the car business. And I said, if I'm walking onto the lot with a cashier's check to buy one of your cars and there's some dude, you know, with a poster of that car standing by the administrative office, should we pay that guy for, for the sale? No, we shouldn't. I mean, it's, he just happened to be standing there as I was walking into the door. And so, uh, again, I think flatlining to more of a CPM-based model, in my opinion, in, in most cases, is, I've seen is, is a better way to, to do it. But do, doesn't that imply that you have to also have consolidated your agency relationship? Because you have to have one throat to choke in that case. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's in, in a lot of cases, the agency holding companies, um, you know, I'm working right now with Publicis on a number of their very large brands who have demanded to move away from these performance-based uh, metrics because they want they want a different way to measure their media. And I think, you know, our friends at Convertro would definitely, you know, agree with us here that, you know, just using last click, last view is no way to run a railroad anymore. But yet 95% of the people out there are doing just that. And so, um, you know, we can use data in a very appropriate way if we know what we're doing. And it's a lot less, to Craig's point, about the tools and it's more about the people. It's more about the pedigree of people. Uh, that you're using to assemble all of this technology, it requires a skilled operator. I've got clients of mine that generate 10, 12 terabytes of data a quarter. That's not going to fit on a, in a pivot table. I mean, so, you know, again, it's, it's, it's not about, you know, the, 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 the technology. It's, it's more so about having the skilled people to, to help you manage it. One more question, I, and then we're can done. I just add to that real quick? Yeah, go ahead. I'm I just sorry. say, in interim, if you can't get your organization to go to a flat CPM, that, that, that's like a pretty big move. And I applaud the companies <laughs> that have done it. But in the interim, is really just find the right, the right CPA for the partner. And so if you, if you look at regression modeling, if you look at if you can find partners who find introducers, right, to find new customers or people who are, you know, influence them or close them, Every time I get a call by a, by a vendor, they ask me, what's your CPA? And my response is, I don't know what my CPA is for you. It, you're going to bring some value, I hope. You know, either you're going to find people who've been in like the two-month consideration process with LegalZoom, or you're going to find new users. And so we could run a test with you, but I can tell you at the end of the day, like, your CPA is not going to be the same CPA that I judge historical performance on, right? So in the interim, I would say if you get some better tracking, some better tools to help you figure that out, you could, you could, you could steer those people the right way because there's a lot of shops that just won't work on CPM for you. They just won't, right? Well, let's give a round of applause for these great people up here. Five-minute break. There's food outside. There's drinks.